Te va a dar ella el heads up. Hola a todos. Hello everybody. I'm Natalia Suso, consultant in communication and information of the UNESCO Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. Plenary session um, dedicated to taking talking over how to AI affects freedom of expression and how we can promote concrete actions to deal with the benefits and risk of automated technologies on information and technology. Two recent and important UNESCO instruments can give us context to this conversation we're having today. One, the Windock Declaration, which points out that in an increasingly digitalized ecosystem where we share information like never before, and where our data is processed through automated tools, we need a multi-stakeholder commitment to promote transparency in the handling of personal data, accountability in algorithm governance, and a more open decision-making processes in social media platform, both automated and human-related. Whether it's for the detection of hate speech or for combating disinformation or to facilitate journalistic work, the benefits of and risks of AI systems must be considered. The second instrument, the recommendation of the ethics of AI adopted by UNESCO member states in November 2021, the first global normative instrument that offers specific ways to put into action the principles of transparency, accountability, and responsibility, responsibility sorry, that provides policy guidance and that promotes capacity building as an important instrument to guarantee digital transformation based in human rights. As in this global conference, their recommendation is very clear about not using AA systems for social scoring, mass surveillance, and it promotes the mitigation of countering disinformation, misinformation, and hate speech. Taking this into consideration, the objectives of these plenaries today are to discuss the challenges and opportunities of AI systems for freedom of expression. To think which are the similarities between the Windock Declaration and the recommendation of the ethics of AI, to find points of cooperation between the different actors in society, to identify concrete action and tools to advance in the governance and capacity buildings in the challenge presented by the use of AI on freedom of expression. Now to give us a broader context on the recommendation of AI, on the ethics of AI, I welcome virtually Gabriela Ramos, Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences of UNESCO, who is going to talk about setting the scene, recommendation on the ethics of AI. Welcome, Gabriela. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia, and, and great to be at least virtually with all of you. Um, I would have loved to be in Punta del Este in person, but well, it's great to have you all there. Um, and probably just to complement what you have said, uh, is, is, is this uh, recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence is really the first global instrument that is not only focusing on developing this narrative of how much 
these pervasive technologies need to be developed uh, with ethical guardrails and looking at, uh, at the defense and promotion of human rights, human dignity and fundamental freedoms, but it also looks at the how to do it. Uh, probably benefiting from the fact that there were already uh, 100 tools around the world, this recommendation and the way the experts developed it and also how the members um, enhance and strengthen the, the provisions uh, deals with the, with the content and how do we understand the technologies, how it is affecting our societies or people, how it is affecting the, 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 our fundamental freedoms. Uh, but at the same time, developing very concrete policy chapters um, and uh, uh, principles, uh, some of those that you have mentioned, uh, accountability, responsibility, privacy, explainability, proportionality, all these principles, but then the policy chapters to oper oper operationalize these principles. But it, it not only uh, stops there, because uh, to really go further and see how this can be implemented on the ground, the recommendation is ask uh, UNESCO to uh, develop uh, an instrument, the ethical impact assessment, and the readiness methodology to see that all the countries could benefit uh, from it. Um, the recommendation takes a view that artificial intelligence is pervasive and has provided many positive outcomes. But without an ethical guardrail, without effective regulations, it has also many downside risks. Um, among the most salient issues that the recommendation uh, calls is to change, for example, the governance of data. It's to enhance the consent mechanisms. It opens the door for transparency for people to know whenever AI is being used to come to outcomes that affect them. It comes also with very strong uh, compensation and redressal mechanisms. And in summary, I feel that the content is really looking to enhance the rule of law online uh, as we have it offline. Uh, it bans the manipulation of cognitive data for commercial or other purposes and establish mechanisms for a strong regulation and monitoring of the impacts. All members agreed, and this is uh, really interesting because it was 193 members in standing ovation at the last uh, general conference, to agree uh, to, to ban the massive surveillance, the use of AI for massive surveillance, for credit uh, uh, social scoring, or for the granting of legal personality of AI developments. And I know some of you have been discussing uh, these uh, legal issues. And so really it's, it's how do we enhance the, the positive outcomes by establish very strong regulatory frameworks. We have been witnessing for many years this debate about self-regulation, voluntary norms, it's better not to interfere because innovation would stifle. But the recommendations, it is a very strong call that we need effective regulations to protect our environments uh, online. And we know it, it has one chapter on communications, although it also deals with education and, and with the environment, with gender, with labor, with health. But it has a, a chapter on um, communication. And, and this implements in, in this area the many principles that the recommendation contains. And it takes against the view that uh, uh, digital platforms, of course, have opened the space for more inclusive conversations, for more access uh, with very positive outcomes uh, in many regions of the world. But at the same time, we all know that without these ethical guardrails, this immense, immense potential quickly turns into an immense risk. And we have well-documented experience of the abuses that have been impacted on children, on our democracies, on misinformation, and of course, exponentially dividing our societies. We know that the way the media platforms, uh, uh, the social media platforms operate, uh, can lead to polarization of the AI systems and the content. And, and this really has caused a lot of uh, instability and, and, and we need to address uh, these issues. The manipulation of content is also uh, leading people and citizens to take decisions that not are not always really fully theirs. And the digital content is also mainly created in English and therefore whenever there is this uh, uh, will to control 
um, fake news, uh, it's, it's more difficult to do it if, if the fake news and the misinformation is not in English. So the question here is how do we protect the freedom of expression and, re and, and ensure responsibility? And, and we are of the view, of course, because we are the, the place where this recommendation happened, that this can be done only whenever we implement fully the principles, the policies, and the different aspects that the recommendation is advancing to ensure that there is this ethical uh, framework. And given AI's far-reaching impact on the freedom of expression, I want to conclude to underscore that self-regulation is insufficient to keep AI in check and such voluntary standards could easily be disregarded in the pursuit of, of profits. Um, we believe that policies matter, regulatory frameworks matter, and they have the potential to achieve this good balance of strong protection while allowing the freedom from express, of expression to flourish. So thank you so much for inviting me and for sharing with you this important uh, content. Muchas gracias, Gabriela. Thank you, Gabriela. Be the, the only approach. So we have our guests today, all from different uh, backgrounds. Uh, here with me at Uruguay, Fabricio Screlini, Executive Dire Director of ILDA, Latin American Initiative for Open Data. Hola, Fabricio. Rodi Casioquina, Program Officer in the Media and Internet, Go Internet Governance Unit of the Information Society Department of the Directorate General for Human Rights and Rule of Law, Council of Europe. Hi, Rodica. And showing me remotely today, we have Roman Choudhury, Director for the Machine Learning Ethics, Transparency and Accountability at Twitter. And Alfons Alfonso Peralta Gutierrez, Judge for the First Instance and Criminal Investigation Court Number 1 of Roquetas del Mar, Spain, Specialized Court in Criminal International Cooperation. So, they will join us in further participations. First, a general question for you all um, that, uh, that you can have more time, uh, not so much time. <laughs> uh, a general question that is what are, what, what are the key challenges at the nexus of AI and freedom of expression? Uh, given your experience in, in your backgrounds about ethical issues on journalism information, social interaction, personal data, privacy, and human rights. Rodica or Fabricio, who wants to start? Okay, I can, I can start. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, having me here. Um, when we talk, well, I'll try to give a little bit the perspective uh, of the Council of Europe in this. But obviously that when we talk about freedom of expression, uh, we think automatically about the gatekeepers of news and information, and we think about the media actors. And digital transformation has brought a profound uh, change to the media sector. In a digital world, media faces numerous competitors for public attention in a space where uh, news and other journalistic content often appears next to content that is not subject to the same regulatory or ethical uh, frameworks. Powerful research and uh, search and social media platforms have become major players in a media industry and largely assumed control over news and information sources. Platforms rely on users' data, which makes us immediately think about privacy and data protection, to deliver personalized content based on individuals' interests and preferences. In many cases, it's algorithms who determine which content individuals get to see and that creates a digital divide. Uh, and the workings of these algorithms is also often non-transparent. 
Access to technology, skills, and data constitutes another important competitive advantage for the large social media platforms and searching giants over traditional media. News outlets are the speed of digital platforms' content production. This drains compelled to keep up with quality from news, leads to the loss of control of curation and news choice, and takes away energy for um, fact-checking and debunking uh, mis- and disinformation. The overall impact of this new information ecosystem is still largely underestimated. And while March uh, or many of our regulatory um, efforts are directed at the consequences like disinformation, hate speech, and other problematic content online, the causes, the amplification of data exploitation, the flourishing of business models that are based on uh, opaque algorithmic processing of data still remain largely unaddressed. Finally, reliance on uh, often badly defined and badly designed self-regulation by business platform creates conditions for these actors to only introduce measures that leave the business model intact, uh, irrespective of its uh, negative impacts. Alongside uh, this focus on the speed of deletion of possible illegal or harmful online content translates into real risk to human rights, freedom of expression being the first uh, on the list. Um, I would also add that all this requires uh, a strong legal binding framework in addition to the ethical standards, but maybe I can develop that a little bit uh, later. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Gracias. Um, y bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Thank you. Welcome to Uruguay. Thank you to the Department of Maldonado, which is also my hometown and where my family lives. So I want to welcome you all. To our audience um, here and across the globe. So three things I would like to say about the challenges of uh, machine learning technologies and freedom of expression. A, it's about the power to enhance freedom of expression. And this is something that is often not seen but across the pond here in Buenos Aires or in Peru, we are getting to see newsrooms that are using AI in order to enhance their analytic abilities, exploring, for instance, um, corruption cases, uh, making sense of large sets of documents uh, that wouldn't be possible to actually understand without the help of AI, or um, potentially also ma mapping hate speech online and protecting women uh, that are being harassed, basically, um, by, um, by several users of platforms. And this is something probably our colleagues can expand on. So the first thing is that there is hope. These tools can be used for good and to enhance freedom of expression and to enhance freedom of press. But with great power comes also great responsibility, as I think Spider-Man said somehow. Yes. So, um, and with this great power, um, this is uh, something that uh, now poses of our, in our minds as something very dangerous. We are also getting to see from the evidence that's coming out in Latin America, at least, which is where my organization is based and where my understanding um, of these issues came from. And this is mostly around how do you connect um, the automation process, most of what we are getting to see here automation processes and classification or clusterization processes. And how do we make sense of that in the context of what we still have in this continent, which is you know, a democratic and rule of based um, regime, basically. And this is not easy because uh, if we allow certain um, regulation to go forward, we won't be able to audit or we won't be able to understand how decisions are made. And a core issue about living in a place or a country under the rule of law is that the government needs to explain to you how decisions are made. And the current set of regulations available in our continent do not provide for that. And that's a problem for freedom of expression, but crucially for democracy most of, most of the time. Uh, and the third element, and this is also important for freedom of expression or connecting with that, and it was mentioned by Rodica and, and uh, by uh, our UNESCO colleague Ramos, is about data governance. These beautiful algorithms are as good as the data they get. And the data they get is often crap. And the reason for that 
is because it's either poorly um, resourced, I mean, we do not get the good data because we don't have the resources. Um, we don't get the good data because our biases and our history prevents us from getting the good data. For instance, about um, women, for instance, about excluded groups in our society. And the third element here is about how we use that. And we are not getting to see very promising uses of that. We are getting to see actually discriminatory uses of that. So in this, in this map, I would like to say um, that in order for freedom of expression to thrive in this context, we need to address these three elements, innovation, governance, and how do we make sense of this um, in terms of our democratic frameworks in case we want to keep them which is yet to be seen in Latin America. So I just want to debate, but um, I think that Ruman is online. Uh, I think she's, she's there at Twitter. Um, if she's there, can we go to Ruman or to Alfonso maybe? Hi, Ruman. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. So, do you, do you want to join uh, with the question or to something Fabricio said? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, thank you to my esteemed panelists um, as well for your insights. I'd just like to share a few thoughts um, given my role and responsibilities as the Director of Machine Learning Ethics, Transparency and Accountability at Twitter and the kinds of investments we are making into more responsible, ethical, uh, transparent and accessible use of algorithms. Um, so the question at hand to kick off is what are the key challenges at the nexus of AI and freedom of expression? Um, and it goes without saying that Twitter and the notion of freedom of expression is quite the topic lately. So I, I did want to touch a little bit on how do we understand this notion of freedom of expression as it relates to algorithms, and specifically in, in my case, how, as it relates to a social media platform. Um, so the first thing to think about is you know, freedom and what is freedom? So freedom does not actually only mean the freedom to, the freedom to say what you want, the freedom to do things. It's also the freedom from. It includes things like the freedom from harassment, um, you know, and, and that includes things that may violate, uh, you know, a terms of, of service agreement or even violate the law, but also, you know, things that um, all social media platforms and frankly, most human interactions would define as toxic behavior, right? So it is not, uh, we can intellectualize this into something that just exists in the realm of algorithms, but it is not. Our society does not exist without some consequences to what we say and what we do. And, you know, online platforms should, can and should be no different. Um, so when we think about this notion of freedom and freedom of expression, uh, we also need to make sure we are considering the freedom from and not just the freedom to. Uh, and second, I wanted to touch on something that Fabrizio said that I thought that was very important. Um, and it's, you know, who is getting access and what voices are being heard. And this is where AI and this is where algorithms come in. Um, so for any sort of digitally mediated platform, whether we are talking about a shopping app that you may use or a social media platform or anything in between, there is some sort of curation happening, whether it is human curation deciding what you should see or the more likely case, it's some sort of an algorithmic curation, especially the bigger and more sophisticated an organization is. Um, so when we think about responsible use of AI, I just wanna emphasize that there is no world in which there isn't some sort of curation happening, right? So given the millions of things uh, a website can be offering you or a social media platform can be showing you what is curated for you. It can be the function of a sophisticated machine learning algorithm that decides what factors um, should be prioritized or even something as simple, simple seeming as a reverse chronological algorithm is to an algorithm and also holds biases. And specifically they are geographic and time-based biases, right? So if you have a reverse chronological algorithm that is not the opposite of having an algorithm, it is actually an algorithm of a different type, one that is just based on time. The reason I raise this is, again, as we talk about freedom of expression, we have to understand what voices are heard and how we can emphasize 
um, voices to ensure that we're not just hearing the loudest people in the room. We're not just hearing the people with the most resources. And this is of particular interest, um, you know, in in the countries that are not the United States and not Western Europe, um, because so much of the tech narrative tends to over promote or over emphasize the priorities of these regions that the rest of the world, which is frankly the majority of the world's population is often not considered in, in, in these. And especially again, as the conversation uh, seems to sometimes be algorithm or no algorithm which is actually, which is truly two algorithms, one is curated and one is chronological, this starts to matter more. I live in the United States. If I were to try to see content from, let's say, India, um, then that a reverse chronological algorithm would actually make it significantly harder for me to see information there because of the time zone difference between us. Uh, the third thing I would invite us to consider in terms of a challenge at the nexus of AI and freedom of expression is uh, how do we hold organizations and companies accountable? How can companies be transparent? One of the remits of my team, but also, again, this is a freedom from, respect people's rights to privacy and security. So how can we share what we're doing, the models we are using, the kind of data that impact our decisions, but also respect existing privacy and security legislation, um, the, the wants and desires of individuals on the platform to not have their information shared, um, but also balance that with this need to discuss and share what we are doing. To, to further that, we've actually invested in uh, understanding more about privacy enhancing technology to make some of the findings of, of our research available. Um, I'll pause here because I know there'll be a little bit time, a little bit more time later to to talk about all the work that we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roman. So Alfonso, I don't think he's here. To Alfonso, how are you? Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo estás? Hola, muchas gracias. Hello, Natalia. Eh, you, Natalia, Vanessa Dreyer, eh, Pratek, eh, Sibal, Chia Yassin, and the rest of the organization of UNESCO to invite me. It's a completely honor and a pleasure, and sorry not for being uh, present in, in Montevideo. Uh, well, about the key challenge of artificial intelligence, in my opinion, we must uh, know that artificial intelligence is a tool, it's like a knife, so it has pros and cons, and it can boost the freedom of expression and connect people, but also at the same time, it can, it can damage the, the freedom of expression. It can create fake news, disinformation, or deep fake, but also it can help to identify them. Also, it can help journalists with automated generated content and freed it up uh, their time to investigate investigative journalism or uh, spread uh, this information. So uh, in this uh, matter, we must to, to take in consideration that uh, social networks uh, could be addictive according to, to some research uh, and uh, they are not, uh, in my opinion, freedom of expression platforms. They are more uh, designed to optimize the connection time of each user. They are not ad advertising uh, platforms. So uh, it, the difference between social platforms and journalists uh, in, in social networks, there is no uh, verify of the sources and uh, there is uh, no uh, the difference between opinions. Everything is equalized. There are not expert opinions or qualified opinions. Everything twist around how many likes, how many followers, and uh, also the algorithms amplify the most extreme memes, polarized. And we are now surrounded with the most strange conspiratorial theories because fake news uh, go faster than uh, the true facts. So also in, in these uh, challenges, the, uh, the, the law is balancing from a public law to a private social network uh, law because the, the social platforms decide what is per permissible 
with the content moderation uh, system and what is visible about the recommender system. But artificial intelligence, we know, is far of being perfect. The processing natural language system, they are unable to, to evaluate the context, read between lines, the, to identify the local ad idioms, parody, parody uh, irony. So we are becoming worried about the outbreak of bias or uh, the, the black box in a twofold problem, the false uh, positive, and uh, this is the content, it's get removed, but uh, shouldn't have been removed. It's like a techno censorship, and uh, we know that it's possible to hack the algorithms. There is uh, a possible of an organized group that uh, they are like black flaggers in a in a simultaneously report of account with dozens of bots of accounts, it's like a similar, it's similar than civil death and they may result in chilling effect. In the case of uh, false negatives, uh, it's the, the content that uh, should remove uh, disinformation, ox, propaganda, post-truth. Nowadays, they are in the agenda of the national securities of states because they can undermine the human dignity, the human values, uh, democracy or electoral processes. Uh, so uh, also we must uh, take uh, in, in, in our mind uh, that the recommender systems, they track your information, your data, they build up a profile and they target uh, your uh, advertising or your content and this make a bubble effect an echo chambers that it avoids to contribute to a public debate. This uh, can affect the freedom of expression and information because it includes the freedom to seek, to receive and to impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers. And as you have just said, uh, this affects because you don't know what information is excluded from you and you don't know which uh, data is, is tracking and is used for build your profile also uh, trending topics at last uh, trending topics makes us a continuous pressure to to make a statement a comment every few hours and uh, most of times without having been previously correctly informed and also do we have the right to know we are talking with a, with a bot in spain we recently uh, published a digital charter of rights that recognize this, this, this right. And what about the, the freedom of expression of bots? It would be possible that uh, Siri or Alexa could have their own speech. And uh, what about our dreams? If we have recommender systems and maybe we can't have the opportunity to watch a Porsche, a Ferrari, because the algorithms determine we can afford them, uh, what it's going to be with our dreams, our pursuit of succeeding or our, or, aspir or our aspirations to make our dreams could come true. Muchas gracias, Alfonso, por... Thank you, Alfonso, for your initial words. Um, we said this panel is also about concrete actions about um, the, how to deal with AI in freedom of expression. Um, Rodica, how does the Council of Europe is addressing these challenges of AI and automation in freedom of expression? Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Can you hear me? Do you want? Um, no, no, it's work. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so, um, freedom of expression uh, in the online sphere uh, is a dimension that uh, the Council of Europe has started addressing um, already some time ago through different instruments, tackling its different um, angles and specifically the impact of digital technologies on the freedom of expression. Uh, we are a standard setting developing um, organization uh, and we develop standards aiming to assist and offer guidance to <clears throat> states, 
public, private actors, but also internet intermediaries, media, civil society organizations, and other relevant actors in their efforts to protect uh, and promote freedom of expression in the digital age. But our key uh, objective is um, to ensure that the European Convention of Human Rights applies both offline and online. Uh, many of these standards are uh, reflected in the provisions of the UNESCO Ethics of AI recommendation and also in line with the Windhoek Declaration. So we relate much to this perspective to, to start with. I'll just develop a little bit more on our work in that sense. Um, so we take the rule of law approach to the governance of online platforms and other intermediaries with self-regulation by internet intermediaries as important but complementary, uh, um, a complementary form of governance. We started with the um, recognition of role of the new media and also um, with their responsibilities in uh, preventing negative impacts of the use of digital technologies, including selective use of sources, uh, rendering access to news contingent on personal data exploitation or overtake down and BS. Um, in, uh, we've got a specific recommendation focusing on that, and um, it also introduces a number of measures and procedural safeguards to mitigate the risk of illegal content being spread online, and in this sense provides a solid basis for national regulatory and co-regulatory frameworks. As regards content moderation, often performed by uh, means of algorithms or flawed automatic tools, the existing rules are often uh, unclear and unpredictable. It's uh, what, what Alfonso was mentioning before. And we have recent examples of some platform changing policies uh, in the times that we are living. Um, we addressed the content moderation also in a, a guidance note which elaborates on human rights approach to, to looking at transparency, uh, clear legal and operational framework, proportionality, and independent review mechanism. Another tool related to AI used by most platform uh, is looking at the impact of algorithmic system with um, uh, aspects regarding development and deployment, uh, data management, modeling, analysis, transparency, accountability, effective remedies, as well as precautionary measures, research, innovation, and public awareness. Uh, also in the same vein with the UNESCO recommendation, um, we have um, 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 a document focusing on the impact of digital technology, specifically on freedom of expression, and which once again establishes a human rights impact assessment. Um, and last but not least, um, responsibility is also on the civil society uh, and the internet users themselves. And this, in this sense, we systematically integrate the media and information uh, literacy perspective in our standard setting document. Important in all this is uh, the cooperation with the business sector, though. Uh, therefore, uh, the Council of Europe has set up a cooperation framework with uh, internet companies to ensure uh, that we can have a real-time dialogue uh, with them regarding compliance with their human rights responsibilities in a democratic society. And maybe something um, a little bit innovative or not so much anymore is that Council of Europe is conducting a pioneering project for the development of a regulatory framework of AI. Uh, in 2020, uh, a committee on artificial intelligence uh, with a multi-stakeholder component uh, produced a study on potential elements of a legal framework for the development, design, and application of artificial intelligence, of course, based on our standards of human rights, rule of law, and democracy. The successor of that committee is now, um, has now the mission to prepare and organize negotiations for, uh, for this legal instrument. Important to say um, that this legally uh, supposed to be binding uh, transversal instrument will take into account, of course, existing upcoming legal and regulatory frameworks of other international and regional um, uh, fora. UNESCO is also participating uh, in these CHI meetings. And um, whereas uh, tools uh, related to the ethics of AI uh, have been developed, the ethical standards and non-binding guidance may not be sufficient um, sometimes in this very competitive business 
an industry environment. And this is why uh, we are now working on a, on a binding instrument. To conclude, it's uh, important to underline, as uh, Fabrizio was also mentioning, that it's not the technology of, of AI per se that constitutes a potential threat to human rights, democracy, and, and rule of law. On the contrary, we almost cannot live without it anymore. It's, we got so used and having it so constant in our lives has great potential for science, industry, business, and society in general. So there is absolutely no reason in regulating AI in a way that it stifles innovation. Um, but the safeguard of human rights, including uh, freedom of expression, must remain a priority. Thank you. Thank you. So to talking about the, that need for the communities to be heard, also mentioned by, by Ruman, and, and that need of, of the different actors to be heard, mentioned by, by Rodica, Fabricio. You have a lot, a vast experience working with communities all over the world, but mainly in Latin America. How do you make sure, make sure communities are really heard in this process? And how do you think this, this debate has changed in, in all these years? And uh, in which point are we now? No? So it is, I said, two in one question, but maybe. <laughs> Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting one. In the beginning, there was uncertainty. There was this man called Berners-Lee that set up a protocol and set up the web. And no one here knew what on earth was going to happen with that. So uncertainty is part of the game. And we need to live in that uncertainty in order to enjoy some of the benefits of such uncertainty. But in the beginning, there was also decentralization. There was also a sort of level play field. That's not the case anymore. By admission of uh, Mr. Dorsey, um, that field doesn't exist anymore. Centralization came to the internet. Internet relay chat, all those old technologies are gone. And with that, I think the first thing we need to acknowledge is about uh, this unequal level of playing field in which we now are living on. So the fact is that we are not going to be heard unless we organize. And to be fair with that, the current fragmentation of this debate um, impedes uh, many communities to organize and to be seen and heard in order to either protect their rights or in order to influence the policy processes across several countries. So, in the beginning, there was also this debate about openness. We all wanted openness. Uh, and to some degree, we still want that openness. Uh, but also, we now face the challenge to our own open and democratic societies. We no longer live in them. Most of the world no longer live in them. So how data regimes can actually reflect the values of our democracies is something that we might need to be a bit more um, let's say, uh, smart about designing them. Uh, and that leads you know, to the third question, and seeing this, the promise, because you know, in, in a way, these, these, two, well, these two points, previous points, were a bit sad. You know? let's, let's look at the promise. Take, for instance, the people in New Zealand, the Maori people, rescuing their own language using AI, basically, or using machine learning more properly, and, and, and natural language programming, in order to rescue uh, a language that is not forgotten, but to some degree, could be lost in the years to come. This could be easily applied to several spaces here, or several communities in Latin America, where the idea of indigenous data sovereignty is now, you know, essentially starting to emerge. So how we do that, um, and what can we learn from that, is important, because behind this idea of indigenous data sovereignty, it's also our own sovereignty. How do we control the data about ourselves and our communities? Because data is a representation of ourselves, but we, it's not us. But it's how others see us and how others extract value from us or from our societies. And how do we make that subtle connection is part of the challenges that we face now. In the short run, because I, 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 you know, I used to think about this in the long run, but these days I only think in the short run. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's the tragedy of, of living, you know, in, in a in a in a world that's constantly Twitterized. Uh, no offense to the to the platform. It's mostly like the the, the idea that we are constantly running through um, through through media is that. We need to organize these voices to have a seat in the table, but crucially to organize them uh, to make sure that they are included in the representation of data in a fair way, but potentially they are able to address the effects of the use of data in their daily lives. And how, does, uh, how do we make this connection with freedom of expression is a tough one, because quite frankly, f uh, you know, it's a bit uh, out of our league. This is also a systemic issue. And where we stand in this system also matters. So in essence, you know, organize, get these people a voice, and make sure that at least you have every, every, every part in the room. And, and that will be my, my first advice on, on how to advance this agenda forward. Thank you. Roman, so we are talking about inequalities and, and how to get more people here. So um, maybe you can talk about uh, the concrete examples on your daily work and how Twitter is, and how your work maybe <laughs> on your side is doing to give more transparency, transparency and inclusivity for the communities. Absolutely. Um, so there are a couple of initiatives that we have invested in as well as conducted um, that speak to the T and the A in our name, uh, the transparency and the accountability. So the first is our sharing of um, our data related to our image crop audit and our hosting the first algorithmic bias bounty. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with the concept, bug bounties are common in the privacy and security world where individuals are paid to find problems with, with software um, for companies. So in, it helps to essentially crowdsource issues and problems. Now, nothing similar had ever actually been built for algorithmic bias or implemented, uh, although a lot of folks have talked about it, talked about how to construct it, what it might look like. So my team at Twitter actually was the first to conduct a bias bounty. Um, and there are a couple of things that are really important out of this. First is that, you know, the purpose of a security bounty, one of the purposes is to essentially crowdsource, right? Like find lots of problems that maybe a team could not find. For a bias bounty, it holds different meaning. So first, we ensured that um, our challenge was open to everybody in the world, recognizing that the reflection, reflections and the priorities that are presented in my team are those of a privileged few. Um, and the, the level of access to understanding and appreciating these algorithms is actually not open to most people. So one is we opened it up to everybody in the world so that everybody could participate. Two is that um, we made we constructed the challenge and the grading rubric such that you did not necessarily have to be able to code or program in order to participate in it. And indeed, uh, we had prizes for different kinds of submissions, including most innovative. Um, and they ranged from our, you know, our, some of our winners who designed novel machine learning algorithms that essentially worked like Instagram filters uh, in order to subvert the algorithm and to other folks who used a, a no-code approach to essentially padding pixels in images in order to trick the, the, uh, the model into focusing on different parts of an image. So we tried to embrace those two. So, you know, inclusivity means many things. It can also, it means geographic inclusivity. It means skill level and access inclusivity. Um, but it also means, you know, how do we have meaningful narratives um, and not just narratives, but implement into practice what folks who are not machine learning, machine learning programmers say. Um, so that's what, that was our first investment. And as I alluded to earlier, we've made an investment in privacy enhancing tech. Uh, and the goal of that is to start uh, improving how we are able to share Twitter data to replicate the kind of findings that we have come, from, uh, come out of our team, as well as Twitter writ large. Specifically, um, we want to be able to more widely share the data that we used to do our analysis on political uh, amplification um, of the on the Twitter platform. So last year we published a paper that demonstrated um, that in multiple countries there was algorithmic amplification of center right po uh, politicians and their content uh, over other groups and parties, um, and 
because some of that utilized information that's not available via the public API, again, for privacy and security purposes, um, we understand that it is hard to purely replicate uh, the findings that, that we have other than sort of a select few pieces of information we're able to share. Our goal is to be more transparent, more open, um, and be able to give lots of people access to our data. The first steps in that is actually thinking through this, uh, this new and still at scale untested technology known as privacy enhancing technology, such as differential privacy, uh, and make that investment to actually prove out the technology. So our goal is that we're able to share this information more widely, that we're sharing it with third party groups such as civil society, individuals, researchers, et cetera, uh, and that we start building the collaborative trust that happens when everybody is being honest and transparent with each other. Thank you, Roman. So Alfonso, um, talking about your, you recently participated in the UNESCO MOOC on AI and the rule of law. And in your opinion, which are the educational contents that churches need most to, to guarantee human rights uh, are respected in a technologically accelerated scenario? What was your learning on, on that experience, if you want to, to tell us? Yeah, it's important for judges and legal practitioners around the world uh, know what uh, is uh, AI and uh, know that it's not future or science fiction, is the, is the present and the fourth industrial revolution will affect in a cross-sectional way, even for justice, justice power and administration of justice. For example, with algorithms to documentary review or predictive codification, what is called also predictive justice, automated generated contracts, chatbots, or even uh, automated uh, judgments or judicial decisions. But also, as we are talking in this round table, there is a possible affection to human rights with bias and with discrimination or black box. Uh, also, there is an important danger about the, uh, the tracking and the profiling of ideological uh, ideas of judges. So it's a priority to train judges and legal practitioners in artificial intelligence and a rule of law. And I would like to highlight that we are uh, far off uh, having robot judges and a human being is going to be uh, indispensable, superior, and the judicial uh, automated decisions always are going to be under human supervision. So we are not, we, we must not be frightened about uh, AI, we must be trained about AI. And this the UNESCO AI and the rule of law MOOC with Cyber Society and National, National Judicial College for me has been a very unforgettable and very rewarding experience personally and professionally because it gives you not only a complete content about the problems of artificial intelligence in the justice uh, area, but uh, also the possibility to meet virtually with, with colleagues and legal practitioners around the world. And this uh, gives you the possibility to understand the function of uh, AI initiatives in judicial systems, sharing the common issues, troubles, worries, and discuss with them. So I strongly recommend my, my colleagues to, to uh, take part in this MOOC, and I congratulate to Pratek Sibal and Chia Yacin. And I'm the co-director of a Spanish course of uh, law and artificial intelligence, so I hope we can collaborate in the future. Thank you. So um, we have to be finishing this, this panel, and I'd like to propose each one of you to think of one concrete idea or, or action uh, to go forward to deal with, to deal with um, IA in this freedom of expression scene we discussed this afternoon. So I don't know which one of you wants to, to start, uh, or maybe uh, add some idea that's missing on the conversation, maybe Rodica Fabricia. Thank you. Um, I will just, uh, yeah, uh, maybe uh, 
like wrap up a few points that uh, I would uh, draw from, from this uh, session. Well, first of all, we must uh, stand strong for our shared values, be it uh, in peace times or in times of pandemics or terrible war, as the one that we're having now in the heart of Europe. Um, our standards uh, and their implementation must continue. I would say that we need regulation on AI and uh, also a legally binding one in addition to ethical standards. We need uh, the global debate uh, on the role and place of the digital platforms in this information ecosystem. Uh, and as Fabrizio here and Spider-Man said, uh, <laughs> they need to realize the powers that they carry and that the responsibility comes with that. Uh, as well as in shaping the, the public discourse and the consequences. And also we must not forget that in uh, today's complex digital uh, ecosystem, it is a shared responsibility, both for uh, public and private uh, actors and users to contribute to making full use of the benefits of, of innovation through a human rights rule of law centered approach. We need um, technological expertise and uh, skills, as Ruman was mentioning before, in order to understand the simple difference between a reverse chronological algorithm and curation algorithm. And uh, further on, other um, a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we will need probably a neuroscience approach because today, uh, as I mentioned before in another session, we're still talking about internet as we know it, but there is other version of internets already being developed. Uh, the immersive realities, the metaverses, for example, and that will require an even broader and deeper approach. Thank you. Um. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much to all the panelists and the moderator, um, because today I learned a lot from you. I think I will echo Rodika in it's essential to stand and to understand our shared values, and that's something that, um, as humanity, I think we need to clarify in the current context, um, but we need to stand there. And from there, we need evidence, and, and this is what we are providing. Um, on May 11, we are going to launch the Global Data Barometer, which is a tool that actually measures um, governance, availability, use, and impact of data in 110 countries across the world, in several uh, dimensions. And I think that will give you uh, some evidence, at least, on, on how the world is looking uh, like, particularly at a national level, and what is missing, and, and what we need to do to actually develop consistent uh, data frameworks that are aligned with human rights, uh, that are aligned uh, with um, basic freedoms, and are actually aiming to solve the most pressing um, issues of our day, um, such as climate change or transparency in our governments. So I, I, I essentially recommend you to look at that piece of evidence that we are now producing and hopefully start a conversation uh, around that, continuing the, the current conversation we are having here today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Gabriela, I don't know if you are still there. You want to add something? If not, okay. We continue with Roman. Or Alfonso. <laughs> well, uh, maybe Roman that has just left, uh, she had uh, to leave, uh, maybe uh, she would like to hear this in a judicial perspective. Uh, the past days, uh, there has been a big controversy about Elon Musk's statements about changing the moderation uh, politics in Twitter because they are only uh, going to adapt to the uh, USA law and only the law from the judicial uh, view, uh, usually uh, the scandal is when someone uh, doesn't uh, enforce the law, not when uh, uh, when someone wants to apply the law. So uh, usually the news are when someone commits a crime. And uh, this, uh, this uh, task is far from simple to translate from general human rights to particular rules. And sometimes some content 
could be disturbing or offensive for, for some users or even for companies, but not illegal. The European Court of Human Rights protects also the unmoderated, provocative informations and even what is false, incomplete or inappropriate. The uh, court emphasized the protection even to the ideas that offend, shock or disturb and even when these fake news, oxar and propaganda could be a hybrid threats to the national security agenda, but they are still a protected speech. So I would like to, to finish with a quote of uh, the United States Supreme Court in the case United States versus Alvarez uh, 2012 that says uh, that a uh, remedy for a speech that is false is the speech that is true. This is the ordinary course in the free society. The response to the irrational is the rational, to the uninformed, the informed, and to the straight lie, the simple truth. So, as uh, Rodica said, uh, democracy is not forever, and we need to be careful and protect in an active way the democracy, but the task to identify true information and fake news belongs to the citizens in a critical thinking and with digital literacy. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you all uh, for your participation and attention. I uh, hope you have enjoyed the panel and we continue with another activities. Thank you.